Good morning, everyone. Welcome to New Life Vineyard. It's good to see you today. Glad you guys came out to worship with us. Each week, we always start things off singing some songs to God, just praising Him, loving on Him, thanking Him for loving us first. So uh, we're going to do that again today. But first, would you guys pray with me, please? Father God, we come before you, and we just thank you for this day. Thank you for letting us be here and worship you. Uh, thank you for all that you have done, are doing, and will do for us, Lord God. And I just pray that you would move us closer to you as we hear your word today. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. We you guys stand up and let's all sing together this morning.
praise the Lord our God, the goodness of God, the one who can break every chain that binds us.
There is power in the name Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, to break every says that all creation is going to praise the Lord. Uh, so will I, for sure.
Thank you so much for never leaving us behind. And uh, we thank you for being with us, Lord God. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Before you guys sit down, will you turn around and say hello to those who are worshiping with you this weekend?
Hey, good morning, everyone. Almost there. Okay. Hey, good morning, everyone. Maybe. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. So, like I said, good morning. Uh, one thing you may have noticed is the temperature is going way down. <laughs> Uh, as you can tell, I'm wearing a coat. It is quite cold out. I just want to share announcements real quick. We have a few. Uh, you may notice there is a card near you uh, in one of the chairs. It's our Get Planted card. We really want to get to know you because we love people and we care about them, just as Jesus does, right? So if you could fill that out, let us know who you are, how you got here. We would love to get connected with you and just uh, embrace you with a warm hug. There's also, yeah, QR code on the screen uh, if you want to do it the digital way. It's wonderful. Secondly, we have a women's event September 21st. That's going to be 10 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Uh, yeah, you can check out the bulletin in our uh, handouts that we give out. And yeah, there's also a QR code for that too. Next up, we have Family Promise. It starts next Sunday. Not this Sunday, but next, right? Double check. Yeah, so we need people who are willing to stay overnight uh, to help host. If that sounds like you, please uh, sign up. It's really, really helpful. Uh, and one thing I'm really stoked about some of you know I am the youth pastor here, and I absolutely love that job. We have something really special coming up. Youth, would you come on stage, please? Those of you that are comfortable, at least. <laughs> okay, so reason I brought them on stage is we're going to be doing what we call a fundraiser. Uh, one of the things we really strongly believe here at New Life Vineyard is we love the younger generation, and we want to bless them. We... So, but part of that is also good character building skills require that you do at least some work and you learn what it means to be part of a community. So we're doing a fundraiser of washing people's dogs. We're calling it a dog wash. September 29th, 3 o'clock after church, we're going to do it here. Uh, we'll have some dog pools to try to, like, wash them and take care of them and all that good stuff. Price is yet to be determined. Uh, it will try to be affordable. Uh, donations are obviously super exciting. Um, we are trying to raise $2,000 so we can send everyone here to a camp. <laughs> Yeah, so those of you that have been through some kind of camp in your youth know that it's impactful, that it really transforms you and it sticks with you throughout your childhood. Uh, I know from my own stories, there's been times I've gone to different camps and just felt the love of the Father in a, in a different, different kind of depth, where it's more warm, it's more like continuous, because it's, you know, it's not just one day, it's a whole weekend. So we want to do the same with these guys and uh, these ladies, and just bless them. So <laughs> we did talk about that. Um, we will not be doing cats, unfortunately. <laughs> yep. So we'll be doing exclusively dogs. Uh, one more thing I want to mention on that. We do need some type of help. So supplies is really helpful. Uh, volunteers is really helpful. People that know what they're doing is really helpful. Even if you just, <laughs> even if you just want to coach us and teach us like what not to do, what to do. Uh, if that sounds like you, you can talk to me. I'll be in the back there in the youth room, but afterwards I'll be in the lobby hanging out to talk. So if you want to help, that would be amazing. All right, you guys are good. Thank you. Uh, and lastly. We'll pray for the offering. Well, Jesus, Father, Holy Spirit, thank you so much that you care about us, that you love us intimately and personally, not just in a generic sense, but a very personal sense. 
I thank you, Lord, that we get to partner with you to bless others, to, to be a light in the darkness, to shine forth your love and your kindness. And so, Lord, I pray that uh, the seed that is sown would go far according to your will. We submit it at your feet, and we thank you, Jesus, for this opportunity. We really do love you back. It's in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Isaac. Uh, Isaac is a kind person, and when he was talking about family promise, he said, if that sounds like you, sign up. Uh, I understand that sometimes you need a little more help understanding that it does sound like you, uh, so sign up. Uh, we are filling out more days than we're kind of used to in the last year. Um, when Family Promise does not have a weekend driver to pick them up on the weekends, then they don't stay over the weekends. Uh, but the original model that we've done for a long time is Sunday night to Sunday morning, and we're going back to that. Uh, so I need uh, a few more people to, to help volunteer and, and see us through that week so that uh, Ella, who coordinates this for us, doesn't feel like she has to stay four nights uh, and be here every day. Uh, so let's, let's kind of pick up that slack for her. I also need a small team of people with a little bit of muscle. Since we're running this through Sunday morning, I need some people here around 8.30 Sunday morning to help get the classrooms, uh, with the, get the mattresses out, get the classrooms flipped back and ready so when Amberin shows up, she can be ready to go for children's ministry that morning without a ton to do. Uh, so I, I thank you for those of you that are going to come find me afterwards and say I can help with that. Uh, and Amberin loves you forever, I can tell you that already. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much. That sign up is in the lobby with this nice little grid made out. I can do dinner this night for Family Promise or I can stay over this night and it's going to be good. So this is part two of a series that we patterned off a book I came across called Not In It to Win It. Uh, this is the last part of the series, so some of you might can just, whew, sigh of relief when you leave, go home today. But essentially what I wanted to do was take these two weeks to speak into something that I've been seeing happen in our country, particularly over the last four years. We've had some really disruptive moments over that time span, moments that kind of pulled back the curtain and revealed what some of our dominant values are. We discovered some things about ourselves. The world discovered some things about us. And through the pandemic, through a couple different election cycles, some cultural moments that have happened, uh, events that are just polarizing, through all of that, it became pretty clear that what many Christians and many Christian leaders and bloggers and broadcasters, what they cared about most was winning. That seemed to be the top priority, is just winning. They're so convinced that what God wanted most was for their side to win in our country that we started hearing words used, we started seeing patterns, we started seeing actions and behaviors that honestly didn't sound or, or look much like Jesus at all. We kind of brand it with some scripture language, but it, it really didn't fit what Jesus projects to us. And, and so as they did that, it then kind of empowered their congregations and their YouTube followers to pick up their tone, and we've been seeing this progress. And as we have, uh, I found myself, honestly, just repetitively embarrassed. Uh, I expect the world to look like the world and sound like the world. But when the, the church begins to look like the world and sound like the world, albeit, again, with some spiritual-sounding language, that, that, I mean, it just kind of embarrasses me, okay? Because these are my people, right? Uh, and I have some strong opinions on, on political issues, so I, I feel the pull. I get it. Political polarization it's just part of the American landscape now. It's been that way for a while, and it's not going to change. But what's made it even more tricky, I think, in these last few years is the voice of the middle has kind of all but vanished lately. Now, I've been watching some people leave both parties even in droves trying to find the middle again, but you don't hear that voice anymore. We just kind of get pressured to move further and further to the right or to the left because, you know, money isn't made in the middle. Fame is not gained in the middle. Uh, followers are not acquired in the middle. And as the voices we've been listening to on TV and on the radio and YouTube and social media, as those voices have moved further to the extremes, we're discovering which voices are sometimes discipling certain Jesus followers more than others. Some churches, some church leaders have begun to pick up their cues and their talking points from culture and from networks, I think, more than Jesus. 
I'm not trying to say I'm politically neutral. If, if anybody thinks they can be truly objective in this country, I think you're just being naive. True neutrality is kind of an illusion here, which means disagreement is unavoidable. Disagreement is just unavoidable. Even within the church, disagreement is going to be unavoidable. And there might be some bigger marquee issues from time to time that the church can come together on and say, you know, this is evil or this is righteous. But even then, I bet we'll find a way to disagree on what we should then do about it, right? So we can't be so naive as to think that the more spiritually mature someone gets, they're naturally going to come my direction politically. Disagreement is inevitable. You know this in your marriage, your family, your, your office, you know it in your church, you know it between the kids' ministry and the youth ministry and the accounting people and the people that buy stuff and don't turn receipts on and time. Like disagreement, you know, it's just going to happen. Uh, between your church and other churches, disagreement is unavoidable. Division is a choice. Division is a choice. And our nation continues to choose division, unnecessarily, in my opinion, but that seems to be the ongoing choice, perhaps because division is marketable. It's easy to sell. It makes for clearer winners and losers. The goal, though, is for the church not to choose division, especially within itself. We don't want that. We don't want to respond to the tension that way, because honestly, it's in the tension of disagreement that we learn and that we grow. It's in the tension that we have those, oh, moments, right? Oh, I always thought that, oh, I'd assumed that that meant this. Oh, I was told people like you were, you never have those moments without this tension. This is where you learn. It's where you grow. It's where you adjust your attitude a little bit. It's where you begin to shift your thinking on some things. And, and you may not necessarily abandon your political views or even like your party, but there's a sense of, oh, I don't have this world quite as figured out as I thought I had. And honestly, it is disruptive in those oh moments because I think you're like me. You, you want to have everything fit neatly into your box where your worldview accounts for all the variables. I mean, just things feel safer and predictable that way, right? And you know how the world works, and you've got God fit in here, and foreign policy fits in in that corner, and it's just all wonderful. But then you bump into somebody or somebody else's experience that doesn't fit your box, and you don't understand it, and you're thinking, well, <laughs> you know what? that kind of makes me uncomfortable. Uh, I don't know how, how you, you could be that uneducated to think that because that doesn't fit my box. You're stretching this a little bit. I, I like my, you can go now. You know, this is, what, this is what makes us mad. But honestly, church, I was thinking about this, you know, through this week, and I realized we should be so good at these kinds of moments. We, the church, should be so well practiced at recognizing there's more to learn, and I don't understand this yet, so let's give it some space and figure it out, look at it from different angles. We, we, we don't have everything perfectly accounted for. We should be masters at those moments. Because if we're Jesus followers, we should be so good at the process of repentance, right? And as we've been learning, repentance is not just choosing to do a different thing. It's, it's allowing your mind to be changed in accordance with what Jesus is showing you. Isn't that the, the first response Jesus said we should have to the news that the kingdom of God has come among us? He says, repent. He says, the kingdom of God is here to shake up your worldview, so let me teach you some new things as you come follow me. And then your behavior will adjust to your new understanding. It doesn't mean that we have to walk around every day assuming everything we know is wrong. Of course not. Sometimes you are right and they are wrong. But the idea that those places may not always be the places you thought they were, that shouldn't be so scary to you. You've been practicing how to deal with your worldview getting rattled ever since you met Jesus and chose to follow him, right? Right? I would hope so. I mean, that's kind of why we're here, you know? So yes, it is uncomfortable. It is uncomfortable. But we should be prepared to have those oh moments continuing as we interact with other people. We should actually be hungry for those moments. We should be getting used to the idea that that's kind of the way life works. So well practiced 
at honestly evaluating challenging ideas, challenging experiences, looking for even a little bit of something new there that can help us understand the world better instead of assuming I have it all figured out. Even if I disagree with everything you just said, at least I can learn a little bit of how to interact with someone that comes from your experiences and has your kind of story and your background. But most of us are afraid to sound like we have more to learn because our lack of confidence in this arena that we're talking about today, it might lose a vote. And after all, winning votes is the most important thing, right? When we get stuck in that mindset very long, it then gets really difficult to hear what I'm going to say next. And this, this might be the hardest thing for some of you from either week of this series, okay? So if you want to disagree and go ahead and cross your arms now and have a bad attitude, you're welcome. I'm not going to think less of you. I just want to say it so that this will be in your head and you can think about it some, because for some of us, this might be a breakthrough idea. There, there's potential here for some real breakthrough, okay? Believe it or not, political disagreement is usually fueled by different life experiences not low IQ. Some of us might chuckle a little bit of that, but some of you have based everything you think you know about our political game we're playing on the idea that the other side is just low IQ. And they don't do their research, and they just listen to what the media tells them, but you, you and your people, you see through the media smoke. You cut right through that haze, and you know everything is actually going on. Or maybe you think it's just lack of character. They're just bad people. You know, maybe unwittingly, but they're, they're playing the devil's game. They're just out to get us. You know, that's a classic. They're out to get us, and they're going to ruin our country. Now, here's the thing. Some actually are. Some actually are. But that's not why everyone across the aisle from you is over there. And some of the people on your side of the aisle are absolutely evil, and some are low IQ, and some don't do their research. So if it's not all true about the people on your side, why are we so quick to assume that it's true about the other side? You know, so what? A couple of the people you talk to don't have sound reasons behind their position. That doesn't mean everyone over there is incapable of an intelligent defense. Now, they may still be wrong but it's not an issue of IQ. When we associate someone's differing political views with intelligence level, when we assume it's just because they're bad people or, oh, I mean, they must never have read their Bible, you know, when you do that, you know what you do? You do unto others exactly what you do not want others to do unto you. You size them up, you write them off, you stereotype them. And I, I don't know all of you terribly well personally, but I'm pretty sure you don't want to be sized up and written off and stereotyped. Oh, you voted for Trump? Well, how does it feel to wake up every morning as a fascist, arrogant racist? Oh, you voted for Biden? How does it feel to go through life as a baby-killing, bleeding-heart liberal? I know everything there is to know about you and your story because I know those Democrats. My niece is a Democrat. She's nuts, so you must be nuts too. You don't want to be treated that way, but we go there sometimes, and we do unto others exactly what we don't want done unto us. Now, here's the thing. We can't go there. We can't. We cannot go there because Jesus didn't go there. And of all the people who could have gone there, it would be Jesus. But God did not size you up and write you off and stereotype you. Every time we sing about the mercy of God, the faithfulness of God, the grace of God, the goodness of God, that's, this is one of my favorite songs still. All my life you've been faithful. Every time I find myself getting down on my knees and confessing the same sin I've been struggling with over and over and over and over, the fact that God in his grace and faithfulness and mercy loves you anyway and loves me anyway and sticks with us through our daily ignorance, it should put us in our place. And he's called us to do for others not just what we'd want done to us. He's called us to do for others what he has done for us. Jesus didn't just suggest this. We have a mandate that prohibits us from going to the stereotypes and the IQ assumptions. Now, if you're not a Jesus follower, I mean, you can do whatever you want. Okay, I'm glad you're here hanging out with us, listening, whatever. You can hate on anybody you want. It's fine. But if you consider yourself a Jesus follower, let's revisit what we started looking at a little bit last week. At the Last Supper, the night before he's arrested, Jesus says this, I give you a new command, love one another 
just as I have loved you, you must also love one another. Now, a quick little aside here. I am today talking mostly about division within the church, okay? But if you think this just applies to how you treat other Christians, let me remind you, last week, Paul, 1 Corinthians 9, he still felt like he was bound by this law even when he was dealing with unbelievers, okay? Just a little dot connecting there. Now, this love from one another, it's not a feelings thing. Jesus is not asking you to do perhaps the impossible and come up with actual affection on the spot for people with ideas that do drive you up a wall, okay? That's not what he's hinting at. What the disciples had watched Jesus do the two and three years before this statement was less about affectionate love and so much more about intentional, action-oriented, external love. Love one another even when you don't agree with them on important things. Love one another especially when you don't agree with them on important things. Someone sent me this meme a couple weeks ago. I didn't have time for it last Sunday, but it still fits there. If you, if you can't see it, it's one of those where Jesus is saying, love everyone no matter what. And one of his people is like, even if they voted for the other person, yes, even if they ask stupid questions. What did Jesus' love look like? It was patient. It was honest. It was, it was direct at times, but definitely compassionate. It was the kind of love that leaned into the people who needed it most instead of pushing them away or making them work for it. So, we can disagree politically, but we still have to love unconditionally. And to be clear, I'm not saying just tolerate them unconditionally. I'm saying love them unconditionally. That might be a stretch for some of us. Pastor, pastor, they are actively trying to tear our country apart. I get it. That's actually kind of the point. Jesus said you are to love one another, not the way you've seen love happen so far, not the way your parents showed you love, not the way your friend group gets along, not just try to avoid antagonizing them more often than not. Do for each other what I have done and am about to do for you. And it's interesting, in that room, when Jesus just first put this this into a, a command like he did in these words, he would have had Matthew sitting to one side somewhere. And, and in those days, Matthew would probably have been considered by his people to be as politically liberal as you could get. And at this point in their walk with Jesus, perhaps even sitting right next to him now is Simon the Zealot, considered by his people of the day probably to be as politically conservative as you could get without being part of the actual priesthood. They've come from these widely different backgrounds and ideals and value structures and understanding of what's best for their country, and they're sitting down together, and they're not just eating this meal. At this point, they had been eating meals together and walking down roads together and sitting around campfires together for a couple of years because Jesus was a bigger reason to be together than to remain apart. And we see signs in Scripture that following Jesus did not change their whole worldview overnight. Those signs pop up all over the place. They walk with Jesus every day, they sit around campfires every night, but following Jesus for even a couple years did not restructure all of their political values and their policy understandings overnight. Some of them you can even see after the resurrection, they're still asking if Jesus was going to live up to their agenda or not. Some of these guys may in some ways have never agreed about everything. And if it was true for them who got to walk side by side with Jesus day after day after day, it'll be very true for you. And Jesus loved them in spite of the fact that they were slow to get it and they were still wrong about probably a lot of things. And Jesus did ministry with them and released them to go minister life to people while they were still wrong about probably a lot of things. Jesus loves you right now in spite of the fact that you are slow to get it and still very wrong about probably a lot of things. I don't say that to offend. It's just true. It's for me too. Look back at your 15-year-old self and tell me you have not learned so much since then about life in the world. Look back at your 25-year-old self if you can, if you're not just 25 right now. If you are, look at yourself. At the time, thinking about how glad you are that you had grown out of your 15-year-old self by then, 
But now you can see that your 20-year-old, 25-year-old self didn't just have a few things out of order. Your whole box of worldview items was just way wrong at 25. That's just part of growing up. That's part of maturing, right? So hang on to some things a little more loosely today because even at 80, 90, 100 years old, you're not done growing up yet. You're not done growing up. The whole point of the Christian faith is that things don't end at 102 or whatever. You know, like there's more ahead. There's more growing and learning and understanding to do. But God, their whole view is so unfounded. It's, it's not based on anything but their personal experience. And I think God's like, well, I hate to tell you, but from where I'm sitting, so is yours. Yeah, well, this is different. Not really. I still want you to do for others what I have done and have been doing for you. And it's not just the nice thing to do. It's not just the don't make waves kind of thing to do. This is mission critical for the church. This is kingdom of God, mission critical. Because when Jesus gave this new overarching command, he gave some explanation. He said, love one another just as I have loved you. You must also love one another. And then verse 35, he said, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. By this loving each other regardless thing, by this unique brand of love that brings people together who are nothing like each other and don't normally like each other, by this unique brand of love, everyone's going to recognize you as one of mine. It's not that you figured out how to vote the same way or that you baptize the same way or that you do communion the same way, sing the same songs. No, the litmus test is how you treat each other how you love one another. It's not just a nice bonus, not an add-on. This is mission critical. And the more we disagree, actually, the more diverse we are, the more noticeable our lives and our churches become. Yes, there need to be conversations about what's right and what's wrong, about sin and righteousness, about personal and national consequences. That stuff needs to be talked about. And I'm not saying both sides are always somehow equally right. But as we work through those things, understand that being geographically and culturally and politically diverse can work to our advantage. It gives us a very unique opportunity. The more diverse we are, the harder it's going to be for us to love each other, honestly, and consequently, the brighter our light will shine when we pull it off. Getting along with people who are just like you, that is not amazing. You don't need me to tell you that. It's so normal, it's boring. Nobody makes movies about that. But loving and serving with and worshiping with and being in a small group with people who are not like you, who don't share everything about your worldview, who don't even share your understanding of which policies this country needs to thrive, that's more of a showstopper. That's going to make some people stop and stare. The Apostle Paul put it this way in a letter he wrote to a group of churches in a region called Galatia. It was a Roman province. So Paul's writing to kind of a diverse group of people across multiple cities, multiple backstories. And he says this, Galatians 6, Brothers, if someone is caught in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual should restore such a person with a gentle spirit. Now Paul's not talking about politics so much as moral Christian behavior. But even when we feel another Christian's political position is stepping into areas of basic morality, which I think we do sometimes, our approach toward dealing with that must be with a gentle spirit. A gentle spirit. He goes on in verse 2. He says, carry one another's burdens. Why, Paul? My life has enough chaos. My burdens are heavy enough. Why do I have to get involved with someone else's mess? Well, I think partly because in in carrying your burden, do you know what that requires of me? It requires me to move in your direction. And carrying my burden requires you to move in my direction. And allowing you to help carry my burden, even when you're someone I disagree with or I don't like or I think you have some issues to work through, that requires a certain humility on my part to let you into my life and know what my burdens are and help me carry them. And honest humility is always a good trait in God's eyes. This requires us to move toward each other. And as we do that for long enough, we discover something. 
we discover that our differences are a little more understandable than we thought. You'll discover why I sit where I sit and consequently take the stand that I do. And I'll understand why you sit where you sit and consequently take the stand that you do. And I may not actually go take that stand with you, and you may not come take my stand with me, but I'm going to understand a little more of why you're there, and you're going to get a little more of why I'm here. And we're going to have some of those eh, moments, and our worldview boxes are going to get kind of jumbled and messed up to the point we either have to just set them down and love each other, or we turn our backs on each other and elevate our politics over our faith and decide we're no longer going to be Jesus followers which is always, always, always a mistake. But even more than you know, learning new things, which is cool, and understanding people in new ways, more importantly than even that, Paul says this, in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. This is how you do it. When I move in your direction, regardless of how different we are, perhaps even because of how different we are, and, and I get a little bit up under the burden of your life, even if some of it's your fault, bad choices, some irresponsibility. But when I go there and when I make room for you to come help me with my burden, I learn something of your life and your story and I satisfy the law of Christ. That's when I know that I'm successfully following Jesus. When we choose to carry someone's burden, what divides us diminishes and what unites us surfaces. And then maybe as a bonus, we get an oh moment out of it. Remember this, anytime you catch yourself saying, how does anybody do that? Why would anybody do that? How could a Christian vote for that person? How could anybody believe that way? The moment you hear yourself saying that or thinking that, just remember you're acknowledging yourself that you don't know some things. If I don't understand why she could vote that way, if I don't understand why he would have said that, there's something I don't understand. There's something I probably should investigate and discover. And maybe they do have something to learn and change because they were wrong. But if so, they're not going to listen to a voice that sounds like just another angry, condescending political opinion any more than you'd listen to that. This is messy for sure. This takes an uncomfortable amount of time. This means you're not going to change the world between now and November 3rd. But it makes you better, and it makes the world better, and this is how the church began, and world history did begin to shift in a big way. When the church first started, and particularly when they started planting churches outside Jewish communities, they had to learn how to connect with very, very different cultures, different backgrounds. And last week we looked at some of the, the position and the mindset that Paul had to take in reaching these people. I want to look now at something he then said to teach these people as they were learning how to come together and worship together and serve together. This is earlier in the same letter to that Galatian group of cities and churches. He said in chapter 3, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, you have put on Christ like a garment. So now there is no Jew or Greek. No, there's definitely Jew or Greek. There's always been Jew or Greek. Some, some of you might have a feel for this statement, but some of you maybe don't. Either way, let's, let's pause for a minute and grasp how ridiculous this was to his first readers. In the first century, the gap between Jew and non-Jew was so wide, it almost destroyed the church right out of the gate. The gap was so wide culturally and morally and spiritually, the differences were just huge. The worldview differences were huge. Well, Paul, no, those... Those non-Jews, they've grown up not observing any of God's laws. They're messed up. They eat unclean food. And, and we Jews have grown up our whole lives with awareness that God himself has told us to be separate from them. God told us that. We aren't even allowed to go have dinner at one of their houses. But bringing these two people groups together in one person's house for a meal and time of singing songs and spiritual teaching. It was a huge change from the norm. It would have required extraordinary patience and extraordinary compromise for these two sides to come together and be part of the same church, living together week after week, day in and day out. 20 years after the resurrection, they were still trying to work this out. And the reason they did not give up and just have the Messianic synagogue over here and across the street, the first United Church of Ephesus or whatever, 
The reason they didn't give up on working this out is they knew God had done something new in the world and for the world, and this church was to be the message bearer, and the way to do it was to do it together. The church had a stewardship assignment of getting this message out to the world and modeling it for the world, and they could not afford to let their worldviews, their economic philosophies, their arguments over foreign policy get in the way of carrying this most important message. So Paul goes on, there's no Jew or Greek, there's no slave or free. Okay, wait, Paul, okay, all right, everybody knows. Paul, I mean, it's self-evident in history, in, in personal experience, it's basic economics. Some people are born to rule and some are born to be ruled. Some people are born to own and others are born to be owned. And, and today, finally, this statement from Paul makes perfect sense. But in that day, it was perfect insanity. It's just how the world worked. Everybody knew that. There's a huge distinction between the owner and the owned. They're not the same. The the world economy of their day rose and fell with this. Every single pagan religion affirmed it. Every single god worshipped from the Greek pantheon to the Romans to the other pagan gods in other territories. It was all just assumed slavery is a thing that will always be a thing. But, But Paul, you're telling me now there's no slave or free in God's eyes? He values the owned as much as the owner. He he gives the same dignity to the owned as he does the owner. And you're implying I'm supposed to treat my slave as my brother? I'm supposed to treat my master as my sister? This is craziness. If this catches on, Paul, it'll end slavery and break the world. Well, eventually it did end slavery. It took too long. But the seeds that eventually bore the fruit and undermined slavery almost all over the world were sown by Christian missionaries modeling this, some of them becoming slaves themselves to minister to the slaves because they were just as important. Other Jesus followers slowly having their eyes open to the implications and choosing to ignore the class systems of their world for the sake of Christ and the message of the gospel. And today, it's it's interesting to look at, anywhere in the world the church is strong, slavery is illegal. And the places where slavery is not illegal are the places where the church is not strong It can't be in the open right now. It's not supported or celebrated. So even as we sit here in America and take this for granted, we can see that even our world today still isn't there. You imagine 2,000 years ago when Jesus first modeled these truths and when Paul was first brave enough to push this message forward. This was so disruptive. But Paul says, well, don't, don't get up and leave just yet. I have another one. He says, neither is there male or female. Again, becoming more evident to us today, though still not where it needs to be. But the seeds were getting planted. If you look at the history, women flocked to the church. They flocked to Jesus. They flocked to the early church. From the way Jesus handled women to Peter and Paul, they're hearing such a message of dignity and value they were not hearing from anywhere else. In Romans, Paul acknowledges more women for their help in ministry, some of them in leadership, than he does men. In Acts, Luke writes about women in influential person, positions in the church. Now, they didn't have freedoms in culture yet. They didn't have access to education. They still had to figure out how to interact that with their culture. But we see in Scripture, they were invited to speak and prophesy in the church. That, that's in Scripture. And however you want to read some of the Scriptures with restrictions on women's roles, you can't let those Scriptures write out the other ones from the story. There have got to be ways to hold them together and find context that help us understand those. The big picture is God does not see a value difference in his family between men and women. And Paul says, for you all are one in Christ Jesus. This shocked the surrounding world as they stood looking. The world did not know how to do this. It was a culturally disruptive unity. Everybody was there in those gatherings, and they refused to allow their built-in differences to divide them. And today, I don't, I don't have to tell you that we run the risk of being divided over a wide range of issues. And, he, and here's the thing. As we work this out, you may never understand. You may never understand why another Christian could possibly be for something that you're against or for a candidate that you're against. And you might agree together that a certain thing is a sin, but you may not agree about the right thing to do about it. You may not agree how... Avoiding this particular sin is maybe not the absolute highest political priority on another Christian's list. And they'll probably feel the same way about you. 
you may never ever come to agreement on some of these issues, which makes it messy and it makes it hard, but it's also what makes it amazing and makes it noticeable when you choose to love each other and live with each other and let that light shine before the world. So what do we do about this? How, how do we actually work this out? Let's start by not distancing ourselves from believers when we disagree. Here's what Jesus said, Matthew 5. If you greet only your brothers, and we have our people, right? I have my people. They're comfortable. They believe mostly like I do. They share a lot of my likes and dislikes. I can relax around them. I can just be myself. I can let my guard down. It's okay to have your people. But if I just had my way, honestly, I probably would only hang with my people all the time. It's just easier. And it's hard to be a human in this world sometimes. So when you find something that's easy, you want to lean into that. But then Jesus comes along and he messes that up for us. He says, hang on, hang on. If I decided just to be with my people all the time, I would never have stepped foot on your filthy planet. Okay? So you can't just be with your people. No, he didn't put it in exactly those words. He did say, if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing out of the ordinary? How's that any different? How's that going to shine? Don't even the Gentiles, and in this case he's talking about you know, the pagans, worldly people around them, don't even they do that? Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, you have to do better than that. You have to be perfect in your love for others, therefore, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. There it is again. Even before Jesus framed this as a new commandment for the new movement, he's teaching them, you can't love the way everyone else loves. If you want to be one of mine, you have to do it the way God does it. I want you to be with your people. And I want you to be with people who aren't your people. Over time, some of them might become your people. Over time, you may realize some things about them that are better than the way you've been, the way you've done it, the way you've thought about it. You just didn't know it because you spent all this time protecting yourself from them. Jesus is saying, I want you to make space for them. I want you to make space for them. I'm not talking about just a wave on the street kind of greeting. I'm talking about making space. I'm talking about when you are with your people and the not your people overhear your conversations, they shouldn't be hearing things that make them feel mocked or think they aren't wanted in your circle so they shouldn't try. They know ahead of time they're not welcome. When you're not with your people, you are so aware of the law of Christ that it governs the way you speak and act and react and what you criticize and how you criticize it and what you laugh at. And when you are with your people, you're still so aware of the law of Christ that it governs the way you speak and act and react and what you criticize and how you criticize it and what you laugh at. Jesus said on the day of judgment, you are not going to be able to appeal to the First Amendment. He said, Matthew 12, I tell you that on the day of judgment, people will have to account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. You stand before God someday, so, but, but the first freedom of speech, First Amendment, and God's going to say, that was really good for where you were at that time. Human governments need that kind of thing. That's not mine. That's not mine. And if you're going to be mine, I'm going to hold you to a higher standard. Some of you need to start fasting from the networks, I think, because they're teaching you and they're pastoring you and giving you permission to speak about the other side in ways that Jesus said will get you in trouble. In the game of politics, it's all about winning and losing. They will demean the other side to make you feel like an idiot if you think about voting the other way or even asking questions about where they are. They play the fear game. Oh, they're coming to get us. Be afraid. We're losing. We're losing. We're losing. You need to give us your money. You need to elect so-and-so because we're going to lose. And I don't know if you've noticed, but both sides are always on the brink of losing. You can't ever be winning in politics. You have to be on the brink of losing so that you can motivate your people to pull it out at the last second, right? Because if they had won, imagine what would have happened. Ugh. They maximize the fear angle on all of these issues. But we live by a higher command to love as God in Christ has loved us and continues to love us. That is the bridge between our disagreements over problems and solutions and candidates and issues. So let me ask you this. 
what would happen if the followers of Jesus today decided we're just going to be Jesus followers? We are going to adopt the posture and the mindset and the attitude and the approach of our Savior and our Lord. I'm not going to be afraid of the other party. I am going to care about righteousness and evil. I'm going to seek the well-being of others in my community in practical ways, as best as I know how, as best as I understand it. But I'm not going to use mocking and belittling or fear or responding to fear as a tactic in this conversation. Because God has come into this world to get you. He sent His Son for you. You can have your wrongs forgiven. You can be led into truth that sets you free. You can love people who are hard to love. Because you are hard to love, and God deeply and passionately loves you. So my encouragement for us today is this. Start making room for not your people in your life. And think about what may need to change ahead of time in your posture, in your attitude, in your words, so that when they get close to you, they aren't turned away at first glance. I'd like the worship team to come up for a closing moment of prayer and worship. Let's help the church regain some moral high ground in our country. And let's do it during the election season. I, I so love our country, and I'm utterly convinced that what's best for our country is for the church not just to settle for law-abiding citizens, not even settle for patriotic Americans. Let's reach even higher yet and be Jesus followers. That's what's best for our country. Let's not do just what we can justify but what's spiritually responsible. Let's, let's do not just what is technically permissible, but what is actually moral according to the, the law of Christ. Let's approach everyone, everywhere, without grumbling or arguing, so that we may become blameless and pure, children of God, without fault in this crazy, crooked, and warped generation, so that we will shine among them like stars in the sky. So that... All who are thirsty out there can feel like they can come to us to find Jesus and know the life offered in his presence, even if it takes them as long to change all of their worldviews as it took the apostles. Are they going to find an environment where they can live that out with us? Let's stand, pray. Lord, I do thank you so much for your faithfulness and your patience and your gentleness with each one of us. And maybe for some of us, there's just a, a recognizing that today. God, you have been patient with me and gentle with me. You didn't write me off. You're not currently writing me off because of my choices, my mindsets, my points of view, my stubbornness. So Jesus, I want to respond to that by saying, I will let you lead. Come teach me new things. I will follow you. I will be one of yours. I'll do what you teach me to do as best I know how while I'm learning better. And for others of us, maybe we're having a moment of realizing, you know what, I have not been treating other people the way Jesus has treated me. I've not been talking about other people the way Jesus would talk about me when he's not with me. I'm not creating an environment with my life and my words in such a way that says, you can come walk with me and not feel sidelined because of some of the values that I do hold very dear. But we're going to walk together, and you're going to know your love. As we respond to you in any one of these ways, I just pray, Holy Spirit, come. Make us new. Keep changing us. Keep transforming us. Keep growing us into the likeness of Christ. You've said that's the goal. Keep shaping our character. Keep forming our worldview so that we see our world the way you see it, God, so that we see the people around us the way you see them, so that we understand some of the political issues of our day the way that you see them, so that we can approach them the way you would approach them if you were here in our shoes. Come be with us. You don't send us out just to do this for you. You send us out and then go with us to do it with us. So Holy Spirit, do what we cannot. Come do the heavy lifting as we just step out to follow you in real way and know that we are satisfying the law of Christ. In Jesus' name.
down who are thirsty down who are we come to the fountain your heart in the stream of life the pain and the sorrow be washed away Father God, we come before you, and we thank you so much for being with us. Lord God, taking on all those who are thirsty and weak, and I just pray that deep will cry out to deep today, Lord God. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Hope you guys have a great day. We have some prayer team down front if you'd like some prayer. Uh, have a good week. See you next weekend. God bless you.